This is the episode of No Dumb Questions where we ask our history correspondent or the n- keeper of memories. What is it? What's her name, Matt? I think that's right. I think is I'm the right the guardian of memories. Oh, yeah. Sounds more epic. Oh, that's even more important. The guardian of <laughs> yeah. memories. That's right. If that's but, not what you are, that's what you are now. That's right. Amy <laughs> Lutz, guardian of memories, is going to help us out. I had an assignment that I wanted you to teach me more about, and I've been reading about it as well. So I think this will be less like the Amelia Earhart episode, which was literally the thing you did your thesis (laughs) on. So you were like an expert at that. So this is a little bit different. But if I understand correctly, the guy's name that I've asked you to research is Witold Pilecki. Am I saying that right? You are not saying that right, but you know what? You're close. You're saying that right in the American pronunciation. So the this is the extent of my Polish understanding, but his name is Witold Pilecki. That's how it's pronounced. Pilecki. Pilecki. Really? Mm-hmm. Matt, you know about this guy, right? A little bit, but I'm here to learn. Okay, so what what I know about him, you know, we, we have there's a, a soft spot in our hearts here at No Dumb Questions for Poland. Mm-hmm. Specifically, Pol- truth. Poland military, uh, Polish military history, and and that came from the the winged hussars, the the famous charge in the siege of Austria. Um, the Austrians were, well, yeah. It's we like Polish military history, but this is a really interesting one because help me out again, Amy. Witold Pilecki. There you go. You got it. Pilecki. So that's mm-hmm. how we say it. Mm-hmm. Uh, spelled W I T O L D P I L E C K I. So, Mr. Pilecki, um did an amazing thing. It's my understanding that he is one of the only people to voluntarily enter into a concentration, concentration camp. Concentration camp, yeah. He signed up for the big one, too, right? He, he, did. he voluntarily went to Auschwitz. Correct. So he's known as the only person to volunteer to go into Auschwitz. There's actually one other example of a uh, a British prisoner of war named Dennis Avey, who did not volunteer to go into Auschwitz, but volunteered to go into a portion of Auschwitz um, where the Jewish prisoners were kept. So Avey had already been imprisoned, and he volunteered to go to another part in the camp because it was such a huge complex. But Vitold Pilecki is the only person that we know about who voluntarily um, allowed himself to be arrested so he would be sent to that camp. Well, he did it before it was cool. Oh, golly, Matt, that's awful. That's the thing. We can't make any jokes in this episode, right? Because, it was, because <laughs> it's tough to I mean, do. what are we going to do? What What do you do? It, we're talking about World War II, and we're talking about the Holocaust, and this mm-hmm. is awful stuff. And Amy, you actually work at a Holocaust museum. I do. What is the name of the Holocaust museum you, you work at? The St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum in St. Louis, Missouri. So, Matt, I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. Have you ever been to a concentration camp? In Germany, like, did you have you done the visit tours of anything like that? No, not in. I've been there, but not in. I've had a few days of just driving around the country, so I can describe the outside, but I've not toured one. What's the outside look like? Bleak. <laughs> uh, okay, in some ways, it reminded me of some of the little forts that you see scattered around the American Midwest. It's that era of architecture. It looks somewhat brick industrial in nature it looks sturdy yeah it looks like an old abandoned fort i guess i I don't know amy you're more equipped that actually sounds pretty accurate i have not been to a concentration camp myself or or anywhere near one but uh, many of these camps including auschwitz were actually previously um, prisoner of war camps uh, internment centers prisons and so it would make sense that that's a bit of what they look like from the outside at least the ones that are still remaining there were a number that were actually plowed under by the nazis as they were retreating oh really I've actually been to one. I went to Dachau. So in and, Germany. Mm-hmm. Yes, in Germany. And complete surprise to me, my, my friend that I was traveling with in Germany, we were meeting with the German military on some rocket stuff, and then we we had a free day. And I'm like, hey, what do you want to do? We're over here. We could just go anywhere. He's like, ah, I'd like to go to Dachau. I was like, Dachau, that sounds pretty cool. Let's go there. <laughs> and I didn't know Blink. what Dachau was. We got off the train. And, you know, he told me it was a concentration camp, and I was like, whoa, that's heavy, you know? And so we, mm-hmm. we, we arrive, and you walk through the gates, and you see, uh, forgive me, I don't know how to pronounce this, Arbeit, or Arbeit Macht Free? Arbeit Mark Fried. See, I should know this, but I know exactly what you're talking about. It says, work will make you free? Is Correct. that is that 
Yeah. Yeah. And there's something very striking about that moment when you walk into the camp because you realize that there was a lot of effort to make this sign to make me feel a certain thing when I walk through this gate. Mm-hmm. There's, it, It's like the whole place is engineered to make me feel something, mm-hmm. and it's not good. <laughs> and as soon as I walked in, I realized, and, and it was lost on me at the time, that I did not have to walk far from the railroad station to the camp. Mm-hmm. They were right next to each other. And I never connected the dots as to why they were wow. right next to each other. And so, you know, I didn't have to rent a car or take a taxi or anything. I just walked off the, the train over to through the gate. And it was, a, it was a solemn moment. And so when you mm-hmm. walked in, everything you described, Matt, all that brick, you know, that oppressive, it was worse than brutalism. And, and I think it's because you know what happened there. But it was mm-hmm. a really, really weird feeling. So... I don't know. I it struck me, and it's something that you never forget ever. <laughs> I'm sure, and it's it's interesting. You mention the work will make you free sign outside. Um, so Dachau was the first concentration camp built by the Nazis. It was established in March of 1933, which is actually two months after the Nazis take control. So if that gives you an idea of their priorities, they set up one of the camps about two months later. Um, 1933? 1933. So Hitler becomes chancellor January 30th, 1933. And then by March, they are forcing political prisoners, those are the first uh, prisoners in concentration camps, um, into Dachau, uh, being the first one. And Auschwitz, which we'll talk about more today, they took that sign from Dachau. That same sign is at the gate of Auschwitz as well, which is, of course, a much larger, well-known camp in Poland. Mm. Mm -hmm. What a weird thing to think about. You know, presidents are always into talking about what they'll do, and they're always evaluated by their first hundred days. Mm -hmm. That falls within his first hundred days. Like, hey, keeping my campaign promises, I got one of those concentration camps I mentioned up and running. That's what success looks like. The stuff you do in your first hundred days in office is meant to satisfy your constituents. Mm -hmm. To say, I heard why you voted for me and I did the things you asked me to do. And look, you can count on me. I am your guy. The fact that it happened within the first hundred days, I think, means something. Oh, oh, absolutely. I I didn't do the math. Did it happen within the first hundred days? Uh, Technically, I mean, if if you, you know, so end of January is when they take take control, 28 days in February. Oh, absolutely, first 100 days. First 100 days is probably, now I'm going to go back and do this math later in my head, but May or June of 33. And by that point, not only had Dachau been established, but the initial um, anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish pieces of legislation had already uh, been passed. On April 1st, 1933, the Nazis launched a, a nationwide boycott on Jewish goods and businesses. So that also tells you what they're doing right away when they take power. Okay, so I I did not know this. I mm-hmm. thought it was more of a gradual, like, boil the frog really slow. But, like, once the power is established and they've consolidated the power, then the secret police follow, and it's just a, it just happens quickly. Don't need to boil anymore. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's both. So in Germany, the situation for German Jews is much different than what it later becomes for Polish Jews, which we'll talk about. And so while the Nazis did begin anti-Jewish actions pretty early— it was more gradual than you would expect. And so there's the boycott, there's the civil service law in which Jews were expelled from the civil service, also teaching positions. Um, Jewish students are expelled from schools. 1935 are the Nuremberg Laws in which German Jews learn, lose their citizenship. Um, it bans uh, marriages between quote unquote Aryans and Jews. And so it starts early, but the events that we probably most often associate with the Holocaust, the, you know, the gas chambers, the massive deportations to camps like Auschwitz, those actually don't start for Jews until much later. Political prisoners, like Vitold Pilecki, are some of the first people interned in camps Mm. in 33. Wow. Okay. So where do you want to go from here, Matt? We want to learn about this guy. We want to learn about what happened. What do you think is a good place to start? Well, I have a question to start with. Why would someone voluntarily check themselves into a concentration camp? So that's a great question. And I'm hoping we can kind of stumble upon an answer as we're going through here. But Vitold Pilecki, so let's move forward to 1939. We were just talking about 1933. 
so he, he was actually born in, in Russia and the Soviet Union, uh, but ends up in in Poland several years later, because around this time, uh, Jews in Eastern Europe were constantly being pushed out of certain cities, pushed out of certain nations and moved elsewhere. And there was a very large Jewish population in Poland. And so he and his family- Is, is Polecki a Jew? No, he's not. He's actually Catholic, but he was witnessing all of those expulsions at that time. And once he sees other things happen in the camp later, he has some kind of preliminary understanding of what's happening. But no, he was Catholic. And so he and his family, he was married with two kids, end up in Poland. Uh, he actually fought in the, the First World War with Poland. And in the Second World War, actually in the lead up to the Second World War, he starts operating um, in the uh, underground resistance in Poland. And so I'm curious if you guys know this, but uh, as you probably do know, Germany invades Poland in, in September 1939, thus beginning the Second World War. Do you know what the Germans did to argue that uh, invading Poland was justified in August 1939? Oh, oh man, this was in my making of the atomic bomb book because <laughs> all of the uh, all of the scientists, there were several of them that were Jewish, and they were freaking out when the civil service mm -hmm. laws were passed, mm -hmm. and then like mm -hmm. they started realizing it was getting hot, and then. Um, no, I don't know the answer. It was also in my uh, – what's the name of the the priest that starts with a B that I read Bonhoeffer. a book about? Bonhoeffer. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it was in that book as well. But I don't remember because I'm a poor student of history. Matt, do you know? <laughs> oh, I'm all ears. I, I just rang my Jeopardy buzzer and I failed. Do you have you it, failed. Matt? <laughs> I – We'll pass to Amy. <laughs> All right, I do have an answer. So as you've alluded to, although most of the pieces of anti-Jewish legislation and the escalating oppression is happening in Germany, later Austria, the Sudetenland, as, which was in former Czechoslovakia, as uh, the Third Reich, the Nazi, Nazi Germany, expands their growth, Hitler and, and the top leaders of Germany always had their eyes on Poland. We don't have to go too much into this, but if you've heard the phrase Liebenstrom, they wanted living space for their expanded um, mm -hmm. nation. And they considered that to be in Poland. A lot of Nazis also had this very racial ethnic hatred of Poles, not just Jews, but Poles and ethnic groups in the East. And so this was this was a plan for quite a while. And so, of course, there were rumblings in Poland that this would happen. But the Germans, ever the propagandists, didn't want to just, quote unquote, randomly invade. They wanted to at least claim that there was some sort of... Um, uh, reason for doing so. And so in late August 1939, they staged a fake attack on a German radio station on the border of Germany and Poland. And so they actually, this is really awful, they dressed up concentration camp prisoners in uh, Polish-esque uh, military uniforms and then staged a quote-unquote fake attack between those prisoners and uh, German SS officers. And so they're claiming to the world after this happens that the Polish military had attacked um, Germany and then they invade Poland the next day. But nothing like that has ever happened since, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's never like, that's happened Like, that's something before. only a Nazi would do. <laughs> that's not the kind of thing that somebody else would do. No. Nobody's as bad as the Nazis. So it's just weird how far-fetched it seems when something that looks like it could be a false flag happens and somebody throws out, like, eh, are we sure? Everybody's like, well, that's crazy. No, it's absolutely ludicrous. Those don't happen, except for when they do. And... I guess that's a pretty good example of one of the times that we know that it did. How do we know for sure that it did and that it wasn't actually the polls, though? It's a lot of different reasons. I mean, at the time, the best that I can tell, very few people actually believe this was a real attack. Because why, why would Poland actually do something like that? The Nazis were also very good record keepers, which ends up getting them in trouble much later. And so there are records of what they did. And, you know, of course, later the, the people who were killed were identified as obviously not being Polish. I mean, anyone who looked closely mm. at this quote unquote attack is pretty obvious what actually happened. Side note about the record keeping thing. I was in the Cosmosphere in Hutchinson, Kansas, which is a really <laughs> cool aerospace museum. They have a full on V1 and V2, you know, the, the terror weapons that, that Hitler had made. And they had some of the documents the records that were kept about this specific V2 that you're looking at at this museum in front of you, 
and it's amazing. Like they mm-hmm. they kept very very detailed notes on like to the engineering standards that most people aspire to today. It's very impressive. So mm-hmm. I cannot imagine the kinds of things that they did, like you know memos or I don't know what the the communication method of choice was back in the day. Did they have a fancy word for memo? I'm or... sure there's a very long German word for it, but I do <laughs> not know what that is. Which Matt will say now. Memogrufenglanzken. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. But but yeah, this, <laughs> this will fun. come up as we're talking. But as you can imagine, when Nazis will, will go way into the future now, go on trial in 1945 and after, they didn't have much to say because everything was on paper in their own words. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Man. Goodness gracious. Destin, I haven't seen sunlight in 20 years, and I don't know how much more I can take. I know. I know. We're here in the submarine, down here at the bottom of the oceans, near the Straits of Malacca, about to make the run into the South China Sea, but I got bad news, buddy. Our batteries are almost empty. We're not going to make it. That which has sustained our life, ironically, has also been our prison, (laughs) and now may become our tomb. I I know, right? And so, here we are. In the year 2312, after the war, down here in the, in the depths of the ocean, trying to survive from the fallout, and uh, the only way we can sustain life here is if we get a charge on our batteries. We live on not just for us, my friend. I remind myself every day in this sunless hell hole that we live on for the fate of humanity. With fortitude and courage, I awake every day eat my gruel slop and look longingly at what's left of the seed bank that gives us some hope of rejuvenating plant life on this planet. Yes, I'm disappointed that the only seeds we were able to salvage were asparagus, and yes, that will have a hugely negative effect on the smell of future humanity's urine, but we soldier on nonetheless. Now the fate of humankind is linked to the fate of asparagi. And it's a burden we must bear with dignity and courage. It is. We the pingers, we the uh, the shepherds of the seeds in the deep, we are the ones that have to endure for agriculture. It's unfortunate that I got stuck with you in this particular submarine. I don't like that fact that that happened. But what I do know is that we need a battery charge on our submarine, and we are approaching the charging station now. Uh, Skipper, could you please look at the screen? Uh, We should have a low-frequency communication message coming in now. Please uh, go ahead and access the terminal. With only a couple of weeks of charge left, we cannot make the Trans-Pacific voyage. But we're in good fortune to have found a charging station. Let me examine the interface. Great googly moogly! What?! The charging station is only activated using Imperial credits from the now defunct Empire, and it requires 600 Imperial credits. No one has 600 Imperial credits. The Empire is defunct. So what are we to do? Nobody has those credits. So just send a message. Tell them, I don't know, nuts. Say nuts. What? (laughs) Nuts. Say nuts. Like in the 1900s when the Patton was surrounded or whoever that was by the other attempted empire. Did you say nuts? Nuts. Did it work? No. No, it didn't work at all. Okay. Uh, well, what What else could we do? What, what other ways are there to pay for the charge that will sustain our asparagus shepherding efforts? I have one remaining idea, and it's just so crazy that it just might work. Then let's do it. What Look, is it? We have two remaining energon cubes. Okay. We could use that to make it maybe a third of the way across the Pacific Ocean, but we have no chance of traversing the entire thing to find another charging station. No. Or we could stay here, run on impulse power for as long as we possibly can, maintaining only life support systems, and use our two remaining energon cubes in the time travel message facilitator yes. to send a message desperately back into the past, pleading for help to try to raise enough credits to use this Imperial charging station to allow us to continue our voyage meant to sustain life. 
question. Yes, Destin, Destin Sandlin. Was the act passed a century ago when you made the effort to have a conversion from Patreon support at patreon.com slash no dumb questions to imperial credits like if people do support on patreon will that be credited to our account for imperial credits so that we might charge the submarine mercifully yes <laughs> that one little ad- <laughs> that one little <laughs> adverb or adjective is what I need to make that decision thank you for bringing it into perspective then, then make it so do it. Use the Energon cubes. Let's send the message to the past, to the back catalog of the No Dumb Questions podcast, which is such a faint memory from That's long ago. That's the most logical place to... Sh- yeah. Yeah, it's the most natural place to send it. Yes. If we want it to be found and for people to understand the significance of the situation... Yes. We would want to send it to the No Dumb Questions podcast. Should we send it to a current episode? No. No, the, the most right. listeners are at the current episode, and we don't want them to be aware of our plight. Sure. We should probably send it to a, I don't know, maybe a, an obscure episode in the back catalog, maybe where an ad used to be that, you know, the, the promo mm-hmm. code is no longer working. That's probably the most logical mm-hmm. place to put it. Don't you think? So we should send it to where only the most dedicated and empathetic of listeners are, scouring the back catalog looking for possible secret messages from the future. Yes. That's who we would want to hear it. That's probably, yes. Send it directly to those people. So, uh, send the message. Do it. Make it so. Number. And what <laughs> shall the content of the message be? Oh, uh, are you ready to type? I'm, I'm ready to type. Uh, send the following message. Dear listener of the obscure back catalog of the No Dumb Questions podcast, Thank you for hearing our plea. I know this is confusing, but we are from the future. We need Imperial credits. 70 characters remaining. 70 70 characters remaining. Seven? Wait, okay. Um, How about this? Patreon.com slash no dumb questions. You are our only hope. Is that good? (laughs) How's that? Send. It's done. Now we wait. So now I... (laughs) Now we just wait. On minimal life support. We have to eat wait. all this asparagus while we wait. Let's do it. Patreon.com slash no dumb questions. Alright. Interesting. So, we invaded Poland. Mm-hmm. Um, Nazi this Germany point, invaded Poland. Easy with the we. No, we we did not invade Poland. <laughs> Careful. I, I don't ever want to invade Poland. The Nazis. Have you seen what they do to outsiders? <laughs> Okay. Did you hear about Vienna? <laughs> yeah, I heard about that. Okay, cool. That was that was bad. Let's just say that didn't happen. <laughs> All right. So the Nazis invaded Poland, and at that point, um, where is Pilecki? So he is. Uh, he almost immediately jumps in to be part of this underground resistance organization, and he actually, with other members of this organization, start making their way to Warsaw. And as you can possibly imagine. In the chaos of everything going on right now, they don't know where they are or what's happening, but it's pretty quick. Um, I'll also add they didn't have a radio at the time with them. And so this is just a bunch of underground resistance fighters just walking through Poland uh, trying to collect information. So, Amy, you don't mean you're not talking about right now like, oh, in the first few weeks he got mobilized, mobilized. You're talking about. Like stuff started happening and he started acting. Very quickly. This almost is, immediately. This is instant. This is real time. Absolutely. Almost okay. immediately. Uh, he, and his, he and his family were not only very proud Catholics, they were very proud Poles. And so it was never really a question for him whether or not he would defend his whole nation. It was just, just jumped in right away. And the Nazis take over Poland very quickly. Actually, within about three weeks, they take Warsaw. So during that time, he is actively part of uh, some of this, this resistance effort. The last resist, at least public resistance from uh, Polish resistors ends in, I think, October 6th. So it's a very, very quick turnover. You know, we talked about, what, 10 minutes ago about the gradual implementation in Germany of these laws against the Jews. So Polish Jews, although there was a suspicion that something like this was happening, and not just Polish Jews, 
polls, um, all polls, um, they did not have that gradual notification in the same way that Germany did. So within three weeks, the Nazis not only have taken over the nation, but they're implementing a series of anti-Polish and anti-Jewish uh, Jew pieces of legislation very, very quickly. And so someone like Witold Pilecki, of course, is seeing this happen in the chaos of, of Poland. And he is actively part of the mostly underground resistance effort to collect information and disseminate <clears throat> intel about what is going on in Poland. Okay, so he died at 47 in 1948. Mm -hmm. So at this point, he's he's, he's a, almost 40. Yes, he's so, some, somewhere in yeah. his 30s. He's married, has two yeah. kids. Oh, oh, really? He's mm -hmm. married and has two kids? Yes. Holy cow. I don't know why, but that changes things for me to, to realize yeah. that... Golly, this guy's a man of action. And he, uh he is. And we'll we'll talk about this specifically about why he went to Auschwitz, how he did it, but he actually does not tell his wife and children what he's doing because he wanted to give them plausible deniability in case Nazi or Nazi collaborators came to their door and asked them where he was. And so they're generally aware of maybe some of the resistance efforts he's doing, but kept mostly in the dark about about what he's doing so so during this time as you can possibly imagine he becomes relatively well known in this underground world and there are arrest warrants out for him and so he spends uh, quite a bit of time you know kind of trying to escape from from the law but I don't know if you know anything about this courier system that Nothing. the underground put together. So they, one of the first things that they do is they put together this courier system where they try to get information out of Poland to Switzerland, to you know France at this point, because France had not yet been invaded, eventually to Great Britain, to get information out about what was happening. And so he's an active part of that. And one of the pieces of information that comes through that system is... Um, information that in August 1940, so this is several months later, August 1940, mm -hmm. a group of Polish political prisoners were imprisoned in Auschwitz. So they were aware that this camp existed. Um, Auschwitz was in Nazi-occupied Poland. All six of what we call the death camps um, were in Nazi-occupied Poland, simply because that's where the greatest Jewish pop or the largest Jewish population was. Um, now it wasn't just Jews imprisoned in these camps, but it was primarily Jews. Later, we'll talk about um, that when we get to it. But anyway, there's this information circulating that this group of uh, basically prisoners of war had been imprisoned in Auschwitz. And then shortly after, their families receive a telegram that they had all died. And it just seems very suspicious. Uh, rumors travel very quickly through underground organizations like this. And so there's a lot of talk bubbling up about what is going on in this camp. And so that's where Vitold starts thinking someone needs to go in and figure out what's going on. And so he ends up being that person. There's, there's a discussion within some of the leaders of the organization about, you know, who it should be. And he ends up actually volunteering. <clears throat> to go into Auschwitz. That's insane. Ex exactly. To get information about what's going on, because the only way they feel like they can get accurate information is to have someone on the inside. How old were his children? Do we know this? Um, Not off the top of my head, but they were fairly young. I believe they were younger than 10. He's all in. Mm-hmm. All in, like I said, does not tell his wife. His children do not know that he plans on doing this. And so, as I mentioned, you know, there are people looking for him because he's well known as, as being part of this organization. And he ends up basically volunteering to become arrested. He kind of, you know, makes it known where he is, turns himself in and um, ends up basically smuggling himself. But, you know, being arrested and sent to Auschwitz in August 1940. It's not a good time to be in Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not a good time. What I read is there was some kind of like street roundup in Warsaw, and mm -hmm. he just kind of went out into the street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, obviously I'm paraphrasing, but that's my understanding. Like he was conveniently in the place where they were gathering up these people. Correct. So, so the. The underground knew about this upcoming plan, about this, this upcoming roundup. And he just, like you said, just happened to be there at the time. That was one of the pieces of information that circulated through the underground. And he ends up being one of the people arrested through that roundup. 
That's amazing. That means they probably had an informant on the, you know, embedded in the Nazis. I don't know who, but what's so interesting is we know about Poletsky, mm -hmm. but there were probably other people doing this sort of thing that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It Absolutely. 100%. And I'm sure that they had some informants. A lot of it, to be honest, was bribery. They just bribed the right people, got information. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if that's how they found that out. Uh, but yes, lots of informants. This was a very well organized, but also very secret underground network. Now we'll talk about this when it comes into the camp, but the way that the Polish underground organized themselves was very similar to a lot of underground um secret organizations in that um, only one to two people usually knew everyone who was involved. Most people only knew the people surrounding them, the people that they had immediate contact with, but no one else in the chain of the underground. Therefore, if someone was arrested, they would not be able to turn in the entire underground. It would just be a, a handful of people. And so that's how the Polish underground worked. It's also how the underground within the camp worked as well. Which is really smart on more than one level. When I used to see that kind of setup described in history books or see it in a movie, I'd be like, oh, that's smart. Then you can't, if you get tortured, you can't rat people out. Mm -hmm. But it's also very efficient on the other side. If Doug gets captured and you know he absolutely has no influence beyond one person either way in the chain, mm -hmm. you don't have to change what you're doing very much. You know exactly what you're doing. And so though Doug may never, ever, ever break, if he knows everything, you've got to change everything. If exactly. that's all he knows, it keeps you in the game and keeps you efficient. Exactly. As well, even if you trust him implicitly. Yeah. It so it was very efficient. Logistically organized. clever. Mm -hmm. Very, very logistically clever, as you said, and very efficiently organized. And so he ends up in the camp, you know, intentionally going in, planning to smuggle out information. We'll talk about how specifically he does that. Uh, so Auschwitz at the time, we alluded to this earlier as we were talking about Germany, but although there were Jewish prisoners in Auschwitz at this time, they were not deported their wide scale until about 1942. And that's one of the things that Pilecki sees as he's in Auschwitz for about two and a half years. He sees the changing demographics of the camp. And so when he enters the camp, he's arrested, you know, in part because of the nature of his arrest, but he's, he's arrested and sent to the camp primarily with other political prisoners. Um, most Jews are still in uh, ghettos at this point. If there are any Jews in the camp, it's, they're, they're typically there because of their political affiliation, not because of their faith. That will change. But at this point, it's primarily a place for Polish political prisoners like Poletsky. Okay. So this boils my blood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I want to crack jokes to keep it light because it somehow assuages the every aspect of what my morality is based around. And I'm not saying it's flawless with just mm -hmm. who I am mm -hmm. is appalled by Nazism, by what happened here. This ticks every box mm -hmm. of what I find to be ethically repugnant. It angers me. Even listening to the story, I watch movies or portrayals of these events, and I don't know what to do with the emotions that I feel when I watch it, mm -hmm. whether it's portrayed even in fiction or in some kind of you know historical nonfiction. It affects my ability to have a simple conversation <laughs> because I don't know what to do. Because I, I'm you feel powerless. Ragingly mm -hmm. angry, even listening to this account. Yeah, I, I think that's a universal feeling. <laughs> I think, have, are you familiar with Godwin's Law, Matt? Sure. Yeah. Amy, you've heard of I'm Godwin's very, Law? Very, very familiar, yes. Yeah, so basically it means as more and more discussion grows online in a place, the likelihood that a reference to Nazis or Hitler becomes more and more likely. Mm -hmm. I think that thing you're feeling right now is universal. <laughs> Everybody... I've never seen anybody that this doesn't just make them furious. And, it's and, incredible. And it's not only universal. It's that feeling that you're having. It's the reason I work at a Holocaust museum. So I've had the same feeling about, you know, studying this over years and years and years when I was an undergraduate, when I was in grad school. And for me, I'm the type of person where when I feel those, I have to do something with it. Like I have to do something. And so my, you know, moral imperative was I have to tell people about this. I have to tell people about this and we have to find a way to create a better world that doesn't look like what happened during the 1930s and 1940s. And we won't talk about this yet, but 
uh, I would ask for you to prepare yourself when we get to the point about, or we get to the topic of how the world reacted to what someone like Vitold Poletsky reveals, because that's the thing that really boils my blood. Um, I read that part. I'm yes. Yeah, I, I, I won't go into it because we'll talk about it. But I don't know that I'm prepared for, to talk about that. But it's yes, I'm with you. Yeah. So we'll get to that. But as we're as we're going through, <laughs> obviously, this is not uh, it's not the most enjoyable topic, but it's important. It's really it's really important. And I think someone like Vitold Poletsky, his heroism shines even brighter when you f- realize the horror that he was surrounded by. Because I mean, I look at a story like this, and I I think. How in the world does someone do what he did? I mean, just just to start with, check you know checking himself in, getting him arrest himself arrested and sent to Auschwitz. I mean, man, I got to tell you, I'd be hiding in my closet or something. I mean, it's just just the level of bravery. But we'll talk about that as we as we he go hit, he hit it head on, didn't he? Absolutely. He's like, hey, here's the thing. Someone told told me one time that they were they were talking to a guy that has been in actual combat. We could talk to Lee about this, I'm sure. But he said that if you come up against an oppositional force, people are going to be injured. And there's going to be casualties. But your unit has the highest likelihood of surviving if you hit it head on. Mm-hmm. If you just go straight at and you just hit the I, – I mean, I don't know that that's universally true – but they said that you have a much better chance if instead of just going into defilade, if you actually engage the the, mm-hmm. the threat. And it seems like that's what this guy was doing. 100%. He's like, I'm all in. 100%. Let's go. I mean, it, <laughs> so yeah. it's what can men do against such reckless hate? Right out right and out meet out them. Me. Right out and meet them. What's that from? Lord of the Rings. It's Aragorn. It's Lord of the Rings. I'm sorry. Amy, when I said that, where is it from? You looked at me with very, very disappointed <laughs> eyes. <laughs> Did you I'm see that? She looked judgmental. at me like, oh. <laughs> I was like, what's you wrong with you? Monster. <laughs> we had been talking about Nazis, but that. So say it again. What can men do with such hate? Ride out and meet them. What can men do against such reckless hate? Ride out with me, ride out and meet them. It's the defeated king mm-hmm. who asks the question, what can men do against such reckless hate? It's Theoden, mm-hmm. who, I mean, his name has Theos in the name. It's, it's intentional. It's the broken spirit of what the author views as being a now dormant, tired, worn out understanding of virtue and justice. And Aragorn, the, well, young looking but old ranger is trying to motivate him to do the one thing that makes sense when that kind of evil manifests and it's what you just said, Destin. Go right at it. Mm. Right out with me. Right out to meet them. Don't put your eyes down. Don't be discouraged. Chin up, eyes up, sword ready. Meet evil and engage it. I got chills when you said that. That was cool. <laughs> <laughs> that was cool. Yeah, that's all. I, I that that resonates with me. Mm. I I just hope that if something like that ever, were to ever happen, I, I well, I don't hope. I wonder. If I were to have mm-hmm. that amount of courage to be able to do that, because you think you you think you have a certain set of ideals, but like if it, I've never been tested like that, I've been in some moments where weird things happen, and I discovered about myself that I ran towards danger in certain moments. Mm-hmm. In other moments, I'm like, oh, I'll just let them handle that. So I just wonder what would happen mm-hmm. if it ever got real. Well, and and I found that those questions are really really important. Because in my studies, I focus on rescue and resistance and things like what Vitold Poletsky did. And I ask myself the same question every time of, you know, what would I have done? And I also, to be honest, I come up short. I think, you know, I don't know. My answer is I don't know. And you really don't know until you've been tested. But the fact that I don't know what my answer to that question is actually inspires me to be a better person, inspires me to try to be the person who would do something like that, even if something, you know, this seems unattainable, but to at least, you know, considering those questions is such a good first step to, you know, really doing a a very difficult but important self-analysis of what you might do during a situation like this. Mm. My wife is scared of snakes. (laughs) Valid. When I say scared of snakes, Matt, you saw there at the reptile museum or whatever it reptile was. Reptile gardens. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was not a joke. That was real. She did not. We tried to hide from her that she was walking under a python <gasps> that was loose. <laughs> that did not we... go well. <laughs> no. So I've always wondered, this is a test I will not run because I love my wife, but I've always wondered what would happen if I were to take, like, when when the kids were small, they were like two years old. I wanted to take like a big rubber snake and wrap it around my daughter 
and then just observe my w- wife walk into the room. Like that is a paradox. What do you do? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you should not do danger, that. Certain <laughs> danger, certain danger thing I love. And so in this case, uh, Pilecki was like, okay, certain danger Poland that I love. Exactly. Or, you know, exactly. I, yeah. I mean, he's, pro- inter- he's protecting the nation. He's protecting his freedom. And, and by extension, he's protecting his family. Um, Mm -hmm. doing what he did. Uh, So when he enters the camp, I mean, this will give you an idea of how long this camp was around and the number of people who entered it. So his uh, his camp number was 4859. So when people entered the camp, their names were taken from them, which is, of course, very dehumanizing, and they were given a number. So he w- was there early enough in the camp that he was not actually tattooed. He received basically a tag with his number on it. Uh, later on, Auschwitz would tattoo that number, as most people know, on the arms of prisoners. Auschwitz was actually the only camp that did that. It was not every camp. It was just uh, Auschwitz. Oh. And I actually looked this up right before we got on. Once everything is, is said and done after the camp is liberated in January of 1945, the camp assigned more than 400,000 prisoner numbers during the time that it was open. And so his number was 4859. So you can imagine how That's many Wyoming. numbers were assigned after that. Yeah. Wow. The people who were immediately sent to their death when they arrived at the camp typically were not given numbers. And so there were far more than 400,000 people in that camp during its operation. You mean they got off the train and they went straight to the chamber? Mm -hmm. They didn't go? Mm -hmm. They go through something called selection, which is a very difficult process that we'll kind of have to wait for later in the story. Well, let's do it. Let's go. Well, where are we at now? All right, so, let's keep. So he's in the he's camp. In, he, he's in the camp. He's, he's in the camp. Got the number forty-eight fifty-nine, and he is forced to participate in real backbreaking labor. So he, uh, you know, to be honest, he's moving rocks around in a wheelbarrow. They basically have prisoners building the camp itself. You know, building reinforcements. Later, building the gas chamber and the cre- crematorium. About two years after this, he works at a local bakery at one point, you know, baking bread. Uh, But the prisoners just forced in really, really tough labor. Priests and Jews in the camp were uh, subject to the worst treatment. Not that the treatment was great for anybody, but they were subject to the worst. And as you can possibly imagine, uh, people did not live very long. Uh, I got to think of think of it off the top of my head, but in most labor camps. So Auschwitz was a combination camp. So later they have the death camp, a transit camp, which is just where people were held before they were sent elsewhere, and a, well, in a concentration camp and a labor camp. So this was a huge facility and he's in a labor portion. And the average lifespan of someone in that position was only about a few months because they got very Whoa. little food. Typhus was rampant. We'll talk about how they use that to their advantage later. You know, they're, they're certainly not given enough food and support to survive. And so extremely, extremely difficult conditions in the camp at this time. What did they understand the reason at this point in the game? What did the prisoners understand the reason for them being in the camp to be? So that changes as, as time goes on. At this point, the best that we can tell is that they thought that they were just, you know, they were in a, they were in a, a prison and forced to participate in labor. Now, as the the labor gets worse and worse, Vitold actually writes down and he says he he starts to believe that this was the Nazis' method of killing Polish pro- political prisoners, just literally work themselves to death. But when they arrive, they think that they're in this horrible prison, and then things become more clear the longer prisoners are there. But in prison because they stole something and they were wrongly accused, mm-hmm. in prison because of ideological crimes, in prison because they pose a threat. What would have been the assumption of your average inmate early on? Yeah, so early on, um, ideological reasons that they were, you know, so someone like Vitold was actively trying to defend and, and wanting an independent Poland, actively resisting the Nazis. And so political opponents of the Nazis at this point were typically in prison. And so for political ideological reasons is why they would assume that they were there at this point. Like the Uyghurs. Yeah, that, I mean, we, that we can go true? down that track. But yeah, I mean, well, the Uyghurs are mostly in camp for religious yep. reasons. That's a, you know, whole other reason. That's an idea. But yeah. uh, in China. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so right now there are people that are being sent to insert whatever term you want to call it, whether it be a prison or a re-education camp mm-hmm. or whatever. It's happening. And there's not great understanding from the Western world what exactly is going down. I, I have to believe 
that there is some type of resistance going on, and I have to believe that the things that we're reading about right now when it comes to Pilecki, I have to believe there's some of these things going on. If there's, I, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about the situation to speak to it, but I can imagine it's very interesting to, to you guys because I know the types mm-hmm. of people you are. <laughs> and significant corporations, our biggest and best and wealthiest, our entertainment corporations are catering to the desires of the government that's doing it. And right now, you feel a little bit of what it must have felt like back then, like you don't really want to say anything about what other governments are doing because everybody wants to play nice. You don't want to jab the bear. But yes, political, religious minorities are suffering this fate right now. Mm -hmm. And we're seeking to get along better with the government that's doing it for economic benefit. And I find that troubling and I don't care who that offends. Well, and and I, I think about this a lot, actually, because there is a... You know, historical parallels are difficult sometimes to make, but there is an important parallel here because the best that I can tell, obviously, as you said, we don't know everything that's going on. And I call them concentration camps. The Chinese government calls them re-education centers, which, of course, is just propaganda. Um, But one of the biggest things that people are doing to basically resist what's happening is get information out about it. So people who were formerly in the camps have gotten out and are giving interviews or if they have relatives um, in, in the camps. And one of the things that just chills me, as we've kind of alluded to, is the fact that we know what's going on over there. I mean, we might not know everything, but we know that something very bad is going on. And as you said, that there are these huge corporations basically making money off of slave labor. And we're just sitting over here in the United States like you know, living our own lives. And so it, 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 I think of this question all the time about what can we do in the West and, and elsewhere, you know, outside China to resist something like that, which was a very similar question that people had during the Holocaust. Well, some of the aspects of the worst portions of the Holocaust were not hugely known until after liberation. It was it was printed in American newspapers. So that, that boycott on Jewish goods I talked about in 1933, that was all over the American newspapers, as were the increasing um, incidents in Germany. And obviously people resisted, and that's a whole different discussion, but it does bring up lots of questions for me about what we're doing today to resist actively ongoing genocide and oppression. Wow. And it's kind of an all or nothing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what are we going to do? invade china exactly it's like what can we do as individuals that's that's your option Mm -hmm. it's like in for a penny in for a pound if you want to go stop that guns ablazing get ready for unbelievable collateral damage and so I, i understand the moral math equation that everybody has had to do in all of the centuries of the mega state and and this massive centralization and potential for this kind of violence and this kind of evil you've got states that aren't doing it and want to be on the side of what is good and right. You got states that take their turns doing Mm -hmm. it, and it's really difficult to stop. And it's like it has to get enough leash before you can develop the political will Mm -hmm. or moral courage to go and do something about it because it's unbelievably expensive. The BSA symmetry principle applies here. I mean, an order of magnitude more energy to stop what the Nazis are doing than what it took for them to do it. No, that's not even a, mm-hmm. that's not even enough. Mm-hmm. It's more than mm-hmm. an order of magnitude to go and stop what they were doing. Uh, more than an order of magnitude, more energy. I mean, and what kind of energy would it take to stop what China is doing right now? I don't know. I don't like that our response is cater to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can live with maybe the collateral damage is too great, and we're running a math equation that's bigger than you know, above my pay grade, and that I can't understand. I have a real moral gripe with cater to it and play along because it's financially beneficial to people who virtue signal left and right about how bad things like that are. Again, don't care who that offends. We can get back to your story, though. Forgive me. So you're certainly not offending me. But there's there's a good segue into this story because uh, Paletsky's answer to that was, you know, what do I do about this is to actively involve him, you know, to sneak himself into a concentration camp and report on it. So the underground was very focused on intelligence gathering and disseminating that information because what they believed was if they got information out about what was happening in camps, uh, what was happening to to Poles, to Jews, to a v- wide variety of people, that the West, specifically Great Britain, would have to act. Because, you know, at this point, it's 1939. Yeah. The U- United States is not in the war yet. Um, so they're primarily mm-hmm. thinking of, of 
uh, well, not France anymore because they had already been invaded, but primarily Great Britain's response. And so a big task um, within the camp, he has two, his two tasks. One of his tasks is to get information out. And another task is to improve the uh, morale of prisoners in the camp. Because as you can imagine how awful morale probably is, you know, a lot of people don't understand what's happening to yes, them. I can yeah, I mean, it's, it's well, and here's the thing: we almost <laughs> yeah. can't imagine. Like we we can guess, we can have a sense of, of what it I is. I can imagine it was low. Yes, you can imagine it was it was not very good. Um, so that's a, that's a big part of what he's doing. So when he gets in the camp, he starts recruiting and connecting with other prisoners, okay. and. One of the kind of secondary reasons he did that was that people involved in this resistance had something to fight for, had something to hope for. Whereas, you know, if you weren't involved, it was just day after day after day, hoping the next day was better, hoping that you were yeah. going to escape a firing squad, you know, whatever was happening. And so this was something that they could be Psychological part of. bolstering to counter psychological intentional demoralization. Absolutely, absolutely. So it gave you a yeah. reason to exist and to not die mm -hmm. and not give up absolutely a reason to get up in the morning a reason to and we could get into a whole discussion of why people lived why people who why why the people lived lived why the people who died died to be honest most of it was luck like people just happened to be in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time but there is an element mm -hmm. of having hope and having something to live for that does bolster your ability to fight for your own life and so that was a a big portion of what they were doing. One of the first people he connects with in the underground is a, a doctor named Daring, who he knew during the underground in Warsaw. So Daring had been arrested about a month before VTOLD. And because he was a doctor, he was actually assigned to um, one of the sort of hospitals, medical units in the camp. Uh, which actually gave him a lot of access to help other prisoners. Now, we won't get too much into during. He has a lot of uh, later. He makes some choices that are a little bit more problematic because the Nazis put him in a position to do difficult things. But we'll we'll put that aside for oh, a second. Oh wow! Um, oh wow! I can I'm imagine still laying that. at the feet of the Nazis. Yeah, well, and crazy. the Nazis yeah. had had were very good at psychological torture. They were very good at putting people in what we call choiceless choices situations where they really didn't have a choice. And so one of the things that During is forced to do is to basically perform medical experiments on prisoners. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah. And so it was his belief that he should do it so he could continue helping other prisoners. We don't have to make a judgment on that right. because it's almost impossible to from 2021. But oh, I can make a judgment on the people who made him do it. Absolutely. 100%. That's a really good way to say that. Like, we don't have to make a judgment on that because it's impossible from where we're at. Absolutely. We weren't there. Impossible. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I do my best not to make moral judgments on these situations because we can't. We just don't know what that was like. Well, OK, to be clear, though, just to make sure we're all still talking about the same thing, but we are comfortable making a moral <laughs> judgment Against a group of people Absolutely. who loaded others on boxcars and shipped them off to be what? executed. Okay, so we're talking about the people who were put in compromising situations. The victims. And we're acknowledging the difficulty of Correct. Yeah, that's, but, that's but, a good clarification. But I, re I really do appreciate that you take the time to, to clarify mm -hmm. that because that's not a thing. I don't know. I, it's it's easy to cast judgment from my house with a refrigerator and air conditioning. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 Anyway, I'm sorry. No, that's totally fine. Not not difficult to make moral judgments against the Nazis, but difficult to make judgments about what victims do to save their own lives because we just haven't so, been in those positions. And so, so this is during before all that. Mm -hmm. and during is the guy's name. During D E R I N G. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is so. Polesky is interacting with during before he had to make those difficult decisions. Correct. Yeah, this is this is still around 1940. And so during is in the hospital unit. He he does a lot of things to try to help other prisoners. He he alters their paperwork to make it look like they're not as sick as they actually are. At one point, uh, about a year or two later, Polesky actually ends up in the hospital with typhus. And during actively tried to keep him in there longer, because one of the things that the Nazis would do is they would go into the hospital units and they would basically kill the sickest prisoners. As horrible as this is to say, draining the resources of the camp. And so someone like during was in a position to try to prevent that from happening as much as possible. Wow. You make a couple moral leaps and that becomes the logical thing to do. Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't take many moral leaps to do that. Yeah. Which gets to an interesting question of what resistance looks like in these camps. 
you know, when I say the word resistance, most people think of like armed resistance, like really active resistance. But sometimes the smallest things can be at, can be uh, examples of resistance. So there's one point um, much later on where the underground network finds out that the Nazis are planning to basically liquidate one of the you know so-called hospitals in the camp. And so during and Vitold and some other people are running through trying to tell people to get away before they are loaded onto trucks and taken to to gas chambers or elsewhere. And they actually save about a hundred people doing that because they. They got in front of it. So there's there's that. But there's also forms of spiritual and cultural resistance. You know, there's one point in, in my research, I came across a case of a number of Polish political prisoners being sent to their death. And on their way there, they were singing the Polish national anthem. And that was their way of resisting what the Nazis were doing in, in their last final moments. You know, there were other people who yeah. who chose to pray. You can do this to me, but you don't get my it, mind. Well, and they chose to die with dignity. You don't get my soul. You don't get myself. It, exactly. Yeah. And so, especially for Jewish prisoners, but for other prisoners as well, you know, praying, participating in any sort of religious service was not going to happen. And so even just uh, making clandestine worship services was a form of resistance. And so you see that a lot in in things like this, you see how people did what they could do to reclaim their dignity. Because as I said, you know, they get into the camp and their name is taken from them. Most of the time their head is shaved, especially for women. That's really, really humiliating. And so people did whatever they could do to try to try to survive. Like I think about what it was like for me when I shaved my head and realized that the hair thing wasn't going to be happening. Mm -hmm. And then I picture what that would be like to have someone forcibly do that to my wife. Ugh. That's a different equation. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, I'm built for it. To s- intentionally strip her of something associated with beauty, n- not to say that you know, hair is required to be a mm-hmm. beautiful woman, but to willfully inflict that shame and that dehumanization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now I'm just going to get worked up it's, again. It's, You're trying to tell a story. <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's un- <laughs> it, well, the thought was to de louse like it reduces the like th- there was a very analytical reason for that and they're like oh well it's less likely to get lice and so that's viewing humans as objects mm-hmm. and as things to be managed rather than as the the soul that they are pieces you move around on your chessboard pieces that didn't sign up that's how they argued it i think that there were there were also very insidious reasons but it's interesting you bring that up because this comes up in be told story in in a form of another form of resistance so Typically, men and women who arrived at the camp and were forced into labor had their head shaved so that they couldn't transmit lice. And lice being really the worst epidemic at the camp because lice transmit typhus, which could be very deadly and very rapid spreading. And so at one point, members of this underground group, including Vitold in in Auschwitz, they end up uh, stealing uniforms and actually like pulling lice off themselves and then uh, breaking into, I think it was an SS officers or the SS, the place where they kept SS officers kept their uniforms and just threw lice on them. Um, Heck yeah. To spread typhus to the I SS officers. And there was at least one officer that I know of who died from typhus because of it. Well, what does typhus do? I'm going to Google it real quick. So, typhus, known as typhus fever, is a group of infectious diseases that include. Endemic typhus. Common sy- symptoms include fever, headache, and rash. Typically, these begin two weeks after exposure. And it's caused by a type of bacterial infection. That doesn't sound pleasant. It Not only does it not sound pleasant, but you can imagine this is 1940, 1941. The medical advances are not what they are now. And on top of that, these people are in a concentration camp. So they're certainly not going to have access to the type of medical care that they need or deserve at the time. And so that's a big reason why typhus was, I mean, it was absolutely frightening to the SS officers, which is in part why it was a genius idea to uh, use lice as a form of resistance at the time. Wow. They that wh- happened at, uh, well, I don't know that it was a resistance, but it was something that famously Corey Ten Boom's mm-hmm more devout sister at Ravensbrook credited God for. I thank God for the lice Mm -hmm. because it keeps the guards out of our barracks. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was absolutely true at Auschwitz as well. I mean, uh, there were times when there was, there were massive epidemics going through the camps and guards would not even come close to prisoners, which in many cases may have saved some people's lives because it kept them separated from the authorities uh, running the camp at the time. That's interesting because when you, 
you know, when I was reading about him organizing these little groups of five people that did the things they did, mm-hmm. you know, inside the camp, I was like, well, how did they communicate without being spied on by the Nazis? Like, how, how do they coordinate with other people? And Lice is part of that answer. That's Lice is part. Is that, is that accurate? I would say that's accurate. I think that's only one part of the answer. I mean, some other, you know, okay. they, they would just communicate with people the best way that they could, often in the middle of the night, because they're certainly in their bunks, you weren't going to have SS officers at there overnight. And so that would at least give them give them some time to communicate. But you actually bring up an interesting question that, that we haven't talked about, which is, you know, so, so Paletsky gets into this camp wanting to transmit information out about what's happening. And so that brings up the question of, of how he got information out. And he did that in, in a variety yeah. of ways. Uh, the, as we kind of alluded to earlier, the, le- the actual letters, there were letters sent from the camp from prisoners out to their families, at least for in the early years of, of the camp. Those were heavily censored. They were often sometimes completely faked. And so those were not going to be reliable ways to communicate to other people. However, at this time, especially for political prisoners, if if a prisoner's family pulled the right strings or bribed the right people, they could get released from the camp. And so uh, one of the things that Pilecki and others would do is they would identify who those people were, you know, just simply by rumors spreading throughout the camp. And when they found someone they felt could be trustworthy, they would give them the information. Often the people would have to memorize it, memorize the information, and then take it back to the underground resistance efforts in Warsaw and in wider Poland. So that was one way that they did it, um, and really a primary way. They would find trusted Nazis. Trusted Nazis? Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. Trusted prisoners. So there, there were, in the early days of the camp, there were prisoners that their family bribed okay. the right people, you know, bribed the right official. Those prisoners would get released. And so the network oh, would- Oh, and so they're the, bribing people outside absolutely, the camp. Yes, I should be clear. They're, they're bribing people outside the camp that pulled the right strings. Okay, got it. Understood. And so those prisoners would take, take the information. Um, there were also a series of escape attempts from Auschwitz. At the beginning, uh, Pilecki is not a huge fan of them because- this is a fairly well-known uh, subject, but most of the time uh, after an escape attempt or after any sort of massive uh, example of resistance, the Nazis, the SS officers in charge of the camps would um, stage retribution. You know, for every one person who escaped, they might kill 10. They might send a group of people to the gas chamber. I mean, really horrible things. And so someone like Pletsky at the beginning, now this changes a little bit, at the beginning was not a huge fan of the idea of escape attempts, of massive uprisings, because he thought that the retribution would be much worse than anything that they could possibly do. However... <laughs> That being said, he does change his mind. And so my favorite story of escape from Auschwitz, again, there's there's only a few cases uh, where this happened, but there were four prisoners. This was, oh boy, I don't know the year, but 41 or 42. Uh, there were four prisoners who staged this escape. And one of those prisoners was someone that Pilecki actually added to this group because he had certain access to, um, well, I'll tell you exactly what he had access to in a second. But a couple of these prisoners, one of them worked on the SS officer's car. Um, He had some sort of mechanical background and that was his job. Another prisoner known by Pilecki had access to the storeroom where they kept the uniforms. And so what these prisoners do, well, first off, they memorize the information that Pilecki has taken about the operation of the camp and they sneak into the building where these uniforms are are kept, dress up as SS officers, get to the car that this one prisoner had taken, and they drive the car out the front gate of Auschwitz and get away. All four of them. They actually they That's they awesome. they do the Heil Hitler salute on the way out because the the guards guarding the gate just assumed that those were probably, you know, SS officers. I mean, the odds of prisoners escaping in a car seem so low that they were just able to get out. That was rare, though. That was that was the only the only case like that. And obviously, there were there were reprisals. I can't remember exactly what they were, but certainly reprisals for, you know, stealing a car of of an officer. Mm. But cases like that, you know, I mean, during those rare escapes or uh, prisoner releases, that's one way that VTOLD would get the information out to the wider resistance effort. Now, I am unclear about exactly how this happened, but they were able to smuggle in and steal enough pieces to build a radio 
in the camp. You told me to research this and I didn't. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what I know about it. Um, okay, I'm so sorry. No. I was excited to research it and I, I failed to. Because you got to figure out the frequency. Exactly. You got to figure out who's on the other side and they have to like be able to receive it. And this was not back in the day when they were recording spread spectrum. Mm -mm. They actually had to like be ready with pencil in hand to write down whatever you're either saying or or, you know, Morse code. Morse code. Out. Yeah. I mean, so, th so this one was designed to transmit Morse code out to uh -huh. now the frequency they were on, how that worked. I have no idea, but they were able to build this kind of makeshift radio uh, to transmit information out. There was another time where another member of the underground, I think it was during actually, was able to get access to a radio in an SS officer's um, office. That was the way that they got information in. And so the BBC was technically banned at this time because obviously they're broadcasting information that the Nazis don't want out. But you can just tune to well, it. Well, exactly. The Nazis tried to jam the I signal mean... but were very unsuccessful about it uh, doing that. And so that's one of the ways that information actually came into the camp was into the camp and into the broader underground in Poland and elsewhere was through the BBC uh, because the Nazis just did not jam it well enough. And so that's one of the ways that the information got in to the camp. What's so interesting is if you're going to communicate with someone, it has, you know, in order to have true communication, you need two way. So I need to be able to tell you something and then you need to be able to be like, oh, okay, I understand that. I acknowledge that I've received the information. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, okay, I have successfully communicated. And so if I was in a, a camp and I had a transmitter, I would just use my dits and das. I, mm -hmm. I, I spent this small amount of time. It was about six months. I had MP3s on a, a CD, you know, long time ago. And I would play Morse code in my car on the way to work every day and tried to learn Morse code. Such a goober thing to do. I'm a ham <laughs> radio operator. I suppose. On paper. On paper, I'm a ham radio operator, but I've <laughs> never actually communicated with Morse code. But, you know, it's all voice now. But I don't know. You would just be tapping your dits and dahs to get out, and you just have to assume somebody got the information. Like, not knowing if somebody heard you would be awful. Well, and, and can you imagine how that would impact the morale um, about yeah. getting information out, hoping someone got it? You know, obviously some information came back in through smuggled, you know, the smuggled radio or the access radio. Also other prisoners coming in. Um, sometimes were people who individuals within the camp knew and they could bring information in. Uh, there, there were quite a few ways that information came came in and out. But this becomes very important in, in Vitold's work um, in terms of the type of information he's sending out and the impact he's hoping that it has. And so, you know, he's sending out things like what the camp looks like, the conditions of the camp, really almost a historical narrative about what's happening. One of the things that he wanted to get out was the death toll in the camp. And he he sits around thinking, you know, how am I going to know this? You know, I, I he doesn't have access to the whole camp. But what he realizes is that um, he even writes that he realizes that the answer to that problem was written on the prisoner's arms and written on their numbers. Um, he could look at the most recent numbers tattooed on prisoner's arms and then kind of mentally calculate how many prisoners were still in the camp. And that would tell him the number of people who had perished in the camp compared to the number that were there at the time. Because he had a feel for how many barracks there were. He did. Or, or he did. And and obviously he's communicating with this underground network and able to to pull in that information. So that's one of the things that he's certainly transmitting out of the camp as well. As I mentioned, the Nazis were very good at keeping records. And so often there were a couple cases where prisoners would be able to steal or sneak a peek at you know, record books of some sort from SS officers, and they would communicate that information out. And as VTOLD is, is collecting all of this information, one of the first things he hopes to convince, mostly the Royal Air Force, convince the British to do is to actually bomb the camp, is to destroy yeah. the camp because it was worth doing to prevent the bloodshed. The problem is, and this is, you're going to know more about this than I do. There's a couple problems. First off, obviously, they never actually did it. But there's this rumor that goes throughout historians, so you can tell me the, the accuracy of this, that bombers at the time, especially British ones, had a very difficult time hitting their targets. And so there, there were concerns that, you know, if you were to bomb the tracks to Auschwitz, you might miss and hit prisoners as well. 
So that was one of the concerns. But that was something he was really urging people on the outside to do, to try to convince the Allies to bomb the camp. Like I said, it does not happen. Can we do some role play real quick? Sure. I won't make it weird. Matt, Captain Matt Whitman with the uh, Royal Air Force. You just received intelligence from your radio operator that there is a, a camp where a lot of Polish political prisoners are being executed daily. And you're also trying to fight like the war against the Nazis. What, what, what do you do with this information? And I mean, you understand that there's an awful thing happening in this certain location. So why would you not bomb it? Why would you not try to do something with this information that uh, Poletsky has? Well, I can think of a couple of reasons right off the top of my head. One, I'm not sure we have the technological capabilities to accomplish this if the information I'm getting is accurate. Secondly, what if the information's not accurate? We know that a false flag has just been employed to justify the invasion of Poland. How difficult would it be to false flag this intel to give the impression that this is the source it was coming from when in fact... This is something that's happening at the point of a bayonet and is coming my direction. It isn't accurate at all. What if we're dead wrong about what's going on in this space? And the third thing that I might think about would be we have no ground presence on the continent at all. So we bomb some stuff. What's that going to actually accomplish? Mm. People could run for the hills. They'll just be rounded back up. The reprisals will be massive. Strategically, I'm thinking to myself, well, if this is an actual communication, I understand why someone in the camp would think that this is what we ought to do next. But if I actually want to solve the problem, I need to come up with strategic maneuvers that will allow us to back up whatever we accomplish in the air. Board gaming rule 101 is uh, you can't occupy something that you bomb with bombers or fighters. You have to have ground troops to occupy a country or a territory on a map when you're doing simulation. So, no, I'm going to use those resources in a way that does not put my very limited air force in danger and that operates in support of getting troops on the ground. I think I can save more lives that way than I can by going through with this myopic strategy I'm getting from an inmate. Well, okay, C Captain Whitman, I, I appreciate all those reasons. That's very that's very interesting and important. But, you know, Lieutenant Douglas here, sir, I know we haven't met. But what if we do this? What if we just, like, come up with a bunch of pistols and we airdrop Ooh. them into the camp? Like, we, we, like, drop weaponry onto the camp and we let these people inside the camp that seem to be organized just fight themselves. What if we do something like that? Or we could... Uh, I mean, I don't know, Polish paratroopers or something. What, what do you think we could do? I mean, it's Poland, right? They, they would. What about one of these plans? Would that work? <laughs> okay, role play over. <laughs> Polish <laughs> paratroopers. I think there were. There were. were, were there, there were. But but individuals. There, there were actually not not large groups of people. And where are we going to get enough of those to drop in one? These were strategies. These are noble were... things. I feel the same outrage you do, Captain Douglas, yeah. or whatever rank I'm you Lieutenant. randomly assigned yourself, and I don't know why you didn't use your own name, but we used exactly my name. Oh, D but... Douglas was, uh, the Sandlins were the Douglases before they came over to the New World. That's why I used that. Yeah, it was fun. So Okay, I like what you did. I, there was actually some depth to that. I didn't expect it. There's a little expanded universe action going on. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I'm, that actually happened. Like the General Motors made a bunch of pistols, and I understand this is when the U.S. was involved. But mm -hmm. General Motors made a bunch of pistols. There was a little pistol called the Liberator that was dropped on mm -hmm. France, if I'm not mistaken. And I don't know what was the deal with the Polish paratroopers, Amy. There was something. There was there was Polish paratroopers. There were Czech paratroopers. There were a number of individuals or small groups dropped into hostile territories for reconnaissance missions, for espionage missions. I mean, if you're familiar, if you've ever seen the movie Anthropoid, which is about the operation to assassinate um, Reinhard Heydrich, who was a really high up member, re really orchestrated the final solution. Um, he was actually assassinated near Prague. And that was done by a couple Czech resistors who were literally dropped into the nation to do it. And, and there were similar cases with some Polish soldiers as well. Mm. But again, the target is exactly. one person, not mm -hmm. a garrisoned camp. It sounds great when you're in fifth grade and you're learning about this for the first time to raise your hand and be like, ooh, 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 Mr. Ravenschlag, I have a question. 
why didn't they all just bum rush the guards and rip them limb from limb and then go home? Mm -hmm. And the answer is because there were people on the other side of the walls, mm -hmm. too. That wasn't going to work. You were going right back. The prison wasn't just Auschwitz. The prison was Poland. Mm -hmm. It's the same principle as the Great Wall of China. The wall doesn't keep the Mongols out. The wall prevents the Mongols from retreating when the garrisons inland from the wall are activated by the signals on the wall. And then they're trapped. The Mongols are trapped against the wall. And that's where the slaughter happens. So it's a deterrent that's in multiple phases. And I think it's the same thing here. It, there is no convenient strategy to jump ahead in the order of operations, the Piedmas of what we're dealing with here, to jump right to liberate the concentration camps. So historically, you're mostly correct. Um, I think you're also, sadly, being a little too generous to some of the allies, and I'll explain exactly why. Too generous to the allies? Well, let me explain what I mean. Um, so first off, you're correct in that the technological ability to do so would be very difficult. Um, at this point in the war, let's just skip to 1941, 1942. The, you know, the Americans are in the war. They certainly haven't breached France. It hasn't, you know, D-Day is not until 1944. And the way that the troop movements are happening is you're having the Red Army move from the east and then the Allies moving first up the, mm -hmm. up the boot of Italy and then eventually um, on the west. So you have kind of this almost pincher movement of these two, two groups of troops moving in. And so, to be honest, it wouldn't make too much sense at this point for the Allies to, like, try to jump over the west into the east um, just in terms of, of troop movements. But when I and, say— And as a quick side note there, naval support would be virtually impossible Absolutely. because of the pinch point provided at the Baltic Sea. You're mm -hmm. just not running ships in there to support any kind of operation at this point. It's just an easy, easy place for the Germans to close off. Well, and, and on top of that, you consider the blitz happening in, in London really before the Americans joined. That limits Great Britain's ability to ah. uh, to do a massive, you know, massive invasion. So just technically, you couldn't even get a bomber there if you wanted to. Like mm -mm. you couldn't get a not not and back at this point. Yes, at this point. Now, the reason why I say you're you're probably being a little generous is because there are some more insidious or, or not even insidious but unwise reasons why the british first and then the allies the americans didn't step in as much uh first it's because uh the british did not actually publicize a lot of the information that they received from the camps now now vtold is only one person that's getting these this information out there's actually a series of reports called the auschwitz protocols that are coming from other individuals who have been imprisoned who have escaped who are aware of what's going on and so he's not the only one getting information out. There are multiple people sending information out. So in terms of what Great Britain and the Allies know, they know a lot. They, they know what's happening in this camp, and they have lots of confirmation to prove what's going on. But one of the reasons why they did not publicize it as much, and this is a minor reason, but it's an important one, is they believed that if they published too much about atrocities against Jews specifically, it would increase anti-Semitism at home, which sa sadly is not a wrong assumption because of the amount of anti-Semitism in the world at the time. I mean, the we don't have to talk about it specifically what the United States do, did at this point, but anti-Semitism was rampant in the U.S. State Department at this time. And it was one of the reasons why it took the Americans a long time to step in to actively participate in rescue efforts. Really? It is mm -hmm. mind boggling to mm -hmm. me how fashionable that brand of racism has been for mm -hmm. so long. Mm -hmm. I don't get any kind of racism. And so I'm, I, there's nothing unique that I don't get about this. And I don't even want us to speculate about it because it's gross. But I just don't get it. I don't understand what the issue is or what the gripe is. I don't understand it during the Crusades. I don't understand it even one generation after living memory of the revolts that happened a century after Jesus. Mm -hmm. There's just not stuff to point to. And yet it keeps rearing its head and every people group has taken a turn being anti-Semites. So nobody mm -hmm. gets to be on their high horse here. Mm -hmm. Everyone has taken their turn holding these grotesque views toward this group of people. It's bizarre when you see that crop up over, especially just even the last 150 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why? And it pops up in such bizarre circles. It's like sometimes you talk about strange bedfellows and 
then you get strange rivalries or strange discriminations that don't make any sense to me. And just the idea that this anti-Semitism was widespread and it was everywhere and it was happening when I was a kid, I was like, that has to be exaggerated. That had to just be some kind of propaganda thing in Germany. Mm -hmm. And the more you learn, the more you realize, like, nope, this is some kind of mind disease that has plagued a whole lot of people inexplicably for a really long time. Well, and to give a very, very quick history of anti-Semitism to at least provide some context to this time, you know, as you alluded to, there's there's the early theological anti-Semitism. You know, people believe the Jews are responsible for killing Christ, and that's kind of where some of this starts. And then by the 19th century, it turns into, it kind of merges with this history of scientific racism and eugenics, this belief that there were not only racial differences, you know, there are racial differences, but there are also value differences uh, between different races and the belief that, you know, Jews, African Americans in the United States were somewhat less valuable because of their race. And so this history of anti-Semitism merges with that movement. And so by the time the Nazis take control, this form of racial anti-Semitism, the belief that uh, Jews specifically were a different race and therefore an inferior race of people, was sadly very popular. I mean, you see the eugenics movement in the United States um, kind of play into that a little bit. They also, you know, which we suddenly got very quiet about. And that was popular. It was hot in the 1920s and 30s. It was in Time magazine. People were talking about the medical benefits mm -hmm. that could come with a eugenics-based approach to medicine and thinking about race. And then Hitler started doing it, and it was like, what did we? Uh, we're just going to memory hole that. And it's like we try to pretend that we didn't have this phase here, mm -hmm. and it's very unfashionable because— well, it's very unfashionable to bring up because of what groups it was fashionable amongst in our country. One well, and not even, you know, do we not talk about it, but and not even was it was it that bad. American eugenicists were some of the most extreme, so extreme that the Nazis actually took research from American scientists and eugenicists and implemented it in their own program. So during this time, I mean, we'll, we'll step aside from some of the racial anti-Semitism for a second. There's a, a mass movement for forced sterilization in the United States and elsewhere among the mentally and physically disabled. Um, and there are about 21 states in the 1920s and 30s that have sterilization laws in the United States. And then the Nazis implement a lot of that science, which of course existed in Great Britain and elsewhere, but implement that science into their T4 program, which was their euthanasia program in which they forci forcibly euthanized primarily Germans, actually, um, who, who had mental and physical disabilities. And so... Sadly, although the Nazis take it to a completely different level, some of that research came from the United States. I'm sitting here Googling mm -hmm. uh, United States sterilization laws, mm -hmm. and I'm looking. You're, you're absolutely right. There, there's a list of all the laws. Thankfully, obviously, the first thing I do is run to my state. Like, what did they do here? And it was just a proposed bill here. But, I mean, I'll, I'll leave it to other people to Google their state and figure out what happened when. But I didn't know this. This is uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. jaw dropping. At the uh, the Holocaust Museum in Washington D.C., I had learned about the eugenics stuff, and uh, I also went to Nuremberg. The mm -hmm. uh, the uh, I'm sorry, Amy. What is the big Coliseum? Is it Reich's Coliseum or the? I forget what it's called. It's a big Nazi Coliseum. <laughs> I in do Nuremberg. as well. Yeah. Yeah. The, in Nuremberg. Yeah. In Nuremberg. Yeah. And so there's this really interesting attitude in Germany. When I was at that big Coliseum, all the students were coming through, and and the attitude was never again. Like we haven't mm -hmm. we have a responsibility mm -hmm. of having the conversation about what went down here in Germany, and making sure that it doesn't happen again. Whereas <laughs> you just told me something about what happened here in the U.S. that I didn't know, and mm -hmm. I should know this. Mm -hmm. I should know that there were, you know, <laughs> the role of eugenics back in the day here, you know, because people are wrong often. Yeah. And the yeah. idea yep. that— And wrong in mass. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the idea that we're right. Everything, every law that's on the books right now in the place where you live, third chair, wherever that is, or fourth chair, whatever it is today, wherever you live, there's laws on the books— and it's it's legal to do something that doesn't make it okay. Mm -hmm. Well said. That doesn't make mm -hmm. it right uh, morally, and uh, that that's something we should remember. I think. And in support of that point, <laughs> Destin, you asked if I'd ever been to a concentration camp earlier in our conversation, and I balked a little bit having driven by one, and I'm embarrassed that I don't remember which it was. I was a much younger man when I 
did that uh, couple of day drive around Germany. But I have been to one and I didn't know the name of it. Hmm. And I even know where it is. I've been to a concentration camp in Cody, Wyoming. Hmm. Mm. Heart Mountain Concentration Camp was a relocation camp. Mm -hmm. Sounds better. For Japanese Americans for a brief period during World War II. I can't trust those folks. You know, they're, they're our, our mortal enemies. And so the atrocities of Auschwitz certainly did not occur at Heart Mountain near Cody, Wyoming. But we arrested people for nothing, mm -hmm. relocated them, and treated them like people who were chess pieces on a board and we can do what we want with them. I'm glad that some restraint was exercised, but still, the truth of the matter is, the only camp of this nature I've ever actually set foot in is in my beloved home state of Wyoming. Mm -hmm. there's, ac there's actually a camp in... Um in Alabama, it's called Aliceville. Aliceville, excuse me, my, my southern accent was coming out there. Aliceville. No, Aliceville, <laughs> Alabama, there were actually Germans that were held in Alabama. You know what? I need to get in the car and just go down there and learn stuff. I need to learn what happened there, uh, what, you know, what the, the status of that was. Like, what, were, were these prisoners held honorably? I mean, I, I, I need to understand more about history locally. Interesting. And if you're going to have war, you need to have a camp for captured combatants mm -hmm. because the two alternatives are awful. Defeat them and let them go fight more or mass slaughter, which has been the strategy at other points in history. Those are both bad ideas. And so the idea of some sort of reasonable detention and the expectation of your enemies engaging in the same sort of reasonable and humane detention until aggressions desist. I mean, that's an age old rule of war. And so I don't like war. I'm strongly opposed. That said, if we're going to do it, having some kind of ground rules for what we do when we capture an enemy combatant and how they'll be treated is a good idea. We've seen that go, go wrong. You know, in the American South, we had the Andersonville mm -hmm. uh, prison camp, which was an absolute nightmare. But, you know, oftentimes belligerents honor these rules of war that they make and what to do with a captured combatant and I'm sure it's not fun to be a captured combatant in any type of environment, but what we're talking about at Heart Mountain, not in any way to diminish what you're bringing up, my friend, like that's a different deal. These weren't combatants. They're civilians. These were Americans, mm -hmm. citizens, right. civilians. Like You just looked the wrong way. Your name mm -hmm. was the wrong thing. Your mm -hmm. grandparents were born in the wrong place. Yuck. I don't want part of that. I don't want that to be us. Mm. There that camp sits. This is why some of this history is so difficult for Americans to look at. Because the, the point that you guys were making about, so Germany has had to have a massive reckoning with the Holocaust, which is why they're very big on saying never again. I mean, they went through the whole psychological process of that. We, you know, the Holocaust didn't happen here, at least not the Holocaust we're talking about. Whereas um, in the United States, one of the things at the time that, to be honest, people had to res wrestle with or, you know, try to sadly ignore was the fact that not only were we interning Japanese Americans, but this was the era of Jim Crow. There were African-Americans going to fight for our freedom in Europe who did not have the freedom that they were fighting for in the United States. You know, during the 1930s, there were actually African-Americans who went to Germany seeking greater freedom that they had in the United States. That was in the 30s? In the 1930s. Yes. Wow. Yep. After that was that. before or after Hitler rose to power? Mostly before. So there is a very, very complicated history about how black Germans, African Americans, anyone who was not white was treated under the Nazis. Usually not well. The general idea is that had the Holocaust gone or had the Nazis been in power longer, then things would have continued to get worse for um, Afro Germans, for African Americans who were trapped in in. Germany at the time. But yeah, before the Holocaust, there were people escaping to Germany seeking freedom that they didn't have here in the United States. Well, and there was no military benefit to an alliance with the Jews. You didn't need to keep anybody happy there for military gain. Mm -hmm. Whereas your fellow Axis power, Italy, was strongly connected in Kush or, well, Ethiopia, mm -hmm. as it was. In fact, the longest standing uninterrupted dynasty in human history was Ethiopia, interrupted by Mussolini mm -hmm. and the Italians. And so you were conducting a pretty significant African campaign, and you were going to have a tough time getting along with the locals if there was a Holocaust being carried out against Africans as well. There's, a, again, an order of operations that mm -hmm. was being followed 
Hmm. So one of the things that the Nazis were, were not fans of was what they called, you know, racial mixing. And so there were a number of Afro-German children being born primarily in the Rhineland between black soldiers and and sometimes African-American soldiers, actually, who were there during the First World War and German women. And so the Nazis organized this uh, semi underground, basically sterilization program on these children because they considered people who were, again, quote, racially mixed to be inferior, which gets me back to the T4 program, uh, which was their forced euthanasia program. So the euthanasia program, which actually does not begin until 1939, um, there's two important points about this that connect to our story. First, once information came out about what the Nazis were doing to people who were disabled, there was a huge outcry primarily among Catholics, Lutherans, Christians in Europe, who are just, you know, appalled that the Nazis were forcibly killing people because of disabilities. There was such a big outcry that the Nazis actually, they didn't really disband their program, they just moved it underground. That brings up two things. First off, where that program went, or where the experiments conducted with, within that program went. But secondly, it really makes me think about there was this huge outcry, as there should have been for the T4 program. There was not a similar outcry for what was being done to the Jer Jews in Germany and elsewhere, which brings up a lot of very difficult things that a lot of people, but especially Christians, have to wrestle with. That, you know, this is a really complicated area of history, but... There really was not, I would say, an appropriate response at the time to what was happening to Jews in Germany and in wider Europe. Mm. So that's the first part <laughs> of, of that. Um, the second part is mm. that the T4 program was where the Nazis first started experimenting with gas. They started using carbon monoxide. They would actually force people into trucks enclose the truck, put a, an exhaust pipe in it, and that's how they would kill large numbers of people at one time. Now, of course, the T4 program kind of somewhat goes away, but those experiments with gas move into the concentration camps. And that is one of the things that Vitold Pilecki starts to see happening, especially in 1942. And so he and his fellow prisoners, uh, first they, they see the crematoria built, which is basically built by prisoners in the camp. And they start to see massive train loads of Jewish prisoners arrive, not just Jewish men, but Jewish women and Jewish families arrive at the camp. And notice that, you know, these families are not in the bunks with them. They're not held anywhere in camp. And so through their observations, through the rumors traveling through the camp, they quickly find out this is where the Nazis are impl or not only building the gas chambers, but building gas chambers and using them on a wide scale. And so they had stopped using carbon monoxide at the time. They started using Zyklon B, which was a pesticide, was sadly very <sighs> deadly. That is probably the right very word. Very efficient at what it was. Very meant efficient. To yeah, do. I was trying to avoid the word efficient, but efficient at, at what they were trying to do. Can, can you imagine the weight of you know you're sitting there, you're it's like being on a planet in a big galaxy and not being able to stand back and look at the whole galaxy and get the shape of where you're at. Can you imagine being in a camp and slowly start to understand and become more, you know, the picture mm -hmm. becomes more clear. Like, I saw a child get off that train. I haven't seen a child in the camp. Mm. Once mm -hmm. you understand what you're in close proximity to, the the weight and the evil and the... I do not think I understand what that revelation must have been like. That's that's insane. I mean, it's certainly unimaginable, and it brings up a lot of questions for people inside the camp. Now, these people who were murdered in, in very large numbers were leaving <clears throat> belongings behind. And the Nazis would, you know, call through those and steal things and use them for their own their own purposes. But there were also prisoners whose responsibility it was to... Uh, unload the gas chambers after they were completed, I'll say, and, and, and categorize the items left behind. And there were some prisoners who, you know, would, would if they found items of food in those belongings, they would take them, they would use things that they found to barter. And someone like Vitold, you know, thought about that and said, no, you know, I mean, the, the horror of, you know, going through a dead person's belongings for something for your own was horrifying to him. But lots of prisoners made different choices. You know, if you have a piece of food and 
you're hungry, you know, what are you going to do? So it brought up lots of very difficult choices or difficult decisions that prisoners had to made, but make. But like you were saying, just the weight of that is really important because it connects to something we've talked about already is the, it's almost hard to imagine what was going on in these camps. And so as you can possibly imagine, people hearing about this from the outside in newspapers and radio could not understand the sheer magnitude of what was going on. You know, there were, there were a couple prisoners around the same time, I think a little later actually, who escaped and wrote most of what we call the Auschwitz Protocols, which, you know, revealed a lot of what was going on. And no one said that they were lying, but there were a lot of people who just could not wrap their heads around it who just did not want to believe what was going on because, I mean, why would you want to believe that? You know, it's just- inconvenient. It's inconvenient because to, I feel this in my own heart, if there's a, a truth that seems to be very, very evil, if I'm confronted with that truth, I'm, I don't know, I'm compelled to action. And mm-hmm. action is mm-hmm. difficult, so it's easier for me to dismiss the information than it is to actually wrestle with the question in my head Mm -hmm. of what to Mm -hmm. do with the information. I can see how a person could get there. And I think there are parallels with the the conversation we had earlier about what may or may not be happening in China. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's like, what do you say? Again, it's hard to imagine, but imagine we were us and it was 1942 and we heard this. What are we going to do? I mean, and there's a whole different discussion we could have about how people responded, the rallies, the, you know, boycotting German goods. There were lots of things that people did. But as an individual, it's like it's almost easier to just shut your eyes than realize that you are powerless against something this massive. Yes. It's just hard to comprehend. My eyes twitching. <laughs> my eyes twitching with this car. Like my eye doesn't twitch, but this is... You know, I mean, this is probably not fun to listen to. No. <laughs> yeah, it's not fun for me to listen to. So, but but I think it's important to to understand that the world is not what we want it to be sometimes. And I don't know, my eyes twitching. And I'm just sitting here looking pissed off into the Zoom call for the last 20 minutes, <laughs> making frowny faces and ripping apart this SD card adapter and putting it back together. Mm-hmm. Same thing. I cannot talk about this stuff without a physical reaction, and I want to interrupt you both every Mm -hmm. five seconds to pound the pulpit that much more about the outrage, but also about human Mm -hmm. frailty and all of the meta-narrative that exists here. This is the story about one thing, but this is also demonstrative of the depths of human Mm -hmm. depravity, human stupidity, human willingness, as Destin just mentioned, to out of expedience and personal convenience, only think things to be true that work for us and that allow our psyche to Mm -hmm. hold together. And I mean we when I say all of this. I don't mean everybody else except me because I get how the things are. I have the luxury of being raised in a certain moment in time when we had absolute moral clarity on issues like this. We had just learned a horrible, expensive lesson and I don't for a second believe that somehow Germany was more predisposed Mm. to this than somebody else. Remember, we had these things cooking here, and so did the rest of the West. We were very into the ideology that ended up undergirding Nazi thought. I think the Nazis got to the Mm -hmm. front of the line because they felt jilted Mm -hmm. by World War I. They felt jilted by colonialism. You go around the world, you look at Latin America, Africa, South America, nobody speaks German. There aren't a bunch of German islands in the Caribbean, just little pockets here and there. I mean, Germany tried to get hooks into Mexico the same time everybody else was trying to get hooks into Mexico and Latin America, and they just lost. They just misplayed their hand. They had a little bit of pressure from the East during those centuries. And any other century, colonialism happens. Germany gets to be in the driver's seat of all of that. So Germany looks at it and they're like, what the heck? Like you catch us on like a down few decades, you divide up the whole world. We don't get to participate. I think it's a series of fluke, luck of the draw moments, culturally and historically, that puts Germany in this edgy place of being like, hey, we are, we're one of the big players here. And it doesn't look like it right now globally, but we are. And that got into the blood. It got into the psyche for a little bit. It affected moral judgment because nationalism and shared pride will do that. 
And I don't say that to say, so look how dumb and bad the Germans are. I say all of that to say all of those things could have mm-hmm. sifted out differently and the already negative legacy of colonialism could have sifted out differently. Somebody else could have got dealt out and tried to overcompensate. A few battles could have gone a different way here or there, and somebody else could have been the one that finally got to a place of engaging in this scale of atrocity, and then they would be the bad guys of that decade that we're talking about. But the reality is we had some serious moral problems that everybody in the West was cruising toward when this went down, and Germany got down the road faster. But I don't want my surly tone of moral indignation and outrage and emotion that you're getting from me through all of this to be like, man, the point is Germans are bad. Mm -hmm. The point is humans are bad. The point is we are a mess and we have capacity for such darkness that we would like to imagine is only present in the bad guys in our comic books and our space opera movies that we like to watch But it's in us. And the reason a good bad guy resonates with us is because we see little elements of Darth Vader and Thanos and Sauron in our own soul. We see it in the mirror in that last bit of the reflection. And we see it in the Nazis, Mm. the most deplorable thing that we can imagine that humans have cooked up. We see a dash of some stuff that we're made of there, too. And so it's like they say, you know, if you're really angry at somebody or something, it's because you see a little bit of yourself in there. And if you're angry at Nazis, hopefully part of why you're angry, and part of something that will serve on a check against your own darker impulses is that you see a tiny little dash of your own capacity for utter abject selfish mm-hmm. wickedness in what they did. I, th- I think there's a, an interesting metaphor here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to screw it up, but as you were talking, I was... I was realizing that you're right. All that stuff exists in my own heart. And in order to confront that, I would like to say, oh, it can be an inside job. I could go confront all that. But there has to be that element of, what did you, Amy, what was the quote from Lord of the Rings? Right out to meet it or whatever. Right out to meet them. Right out to meet them. There has to be a level of willingness to confront the evil that's within your own soul. And sometimes it can't happen you don't understand the own internal evil that exists. Sometimes you have to have that external, um, that external mm-hmm. measurement of your own. It's sin. I'm just going to say the word sin. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm. I am so glad we're talking about this because this is important. But it also underlines the importance of talking about history like this because as someone in my place who not only has studied this type of history for a long time, but has two degrees in this type of history. Learning about the Holocaust broke me, and I had to figure out ways to put myself back together. Because as humans, we tell ourselves stories about ourselves, and we have this egocentric bias that when we learn about the Nazis or we learn about bad things in history, we think, well, that was bad, but I'm a generally good person. You know, I wouldn't do something like that. But then when you really dive into things like this, what you realize, and this is the realization that just broke me, was that... As you guys were saying, humans are capable of great good, but all of us are great capable of great evil if you put us in certain situations. And what we're seeing here is the Nazis were in many ways uniquely evil, but in many ways they were not. I mean, the people who perpetrated these crimes were, they weren't born evil. They weren't, you know, there was nothing unique about them. They were people. You, and- could, you could argue that. You could argue that. <laughs> we're all born evil. Okay, well, we're, I'm, we're, all, I'm, we're all born evil and I'm and kind flawed. of in the okay, total depravity camp. If we're all born good and then we get worse later, the Holocaust doesn't happen. <laughs> the Holocaust is a reflection of how we pop out. You know what I'm saying, though. People were not born Nazis. I they, do. I just, I was just, <laughs> I hear you. I was putting a pin in total depravity. Anyway, go ahead. But to my point, I'm glad you brought this up because in Germany at the time and and elsewhere, I mean, we talk about us now, but in Germany, Germany was a center of culture before World War One. I. I mean, it was sure. uh, yeah. academia was really strong. I mean, basically, the study of history was created in Germany uh, mm. during the, the 19- British monarchy at the time was Ab- born out of Germany. Absolutely. And so there was almost this just like there was elsewhere, this cultural arrogance at the time of we've moved past this kind of thing. You know, if, if you would have talked to anyone at the time and you would have asked them, I mean, this is very counterfactual, but if you would have asked them, where would you expect the most anti-Semitism? Everyone would have said France. 
they would have obviously said France. You know, there's the the German writer Thomas Mann. He was watching the the Dreyfus affair happen in the late 19th century, which was this, you know, we don't have to go into all the details, but this terrible anti-Semitic court case where this Jewish man was put on trial for espionage and basically convicted because he was Jewish. And it was this horrible, horrible case. And so Thomas Mann is looking at that from Germany saying, this is horrible. I am so glad that nothing like this could happen in Germany. That happened. Um, and then that. it happens. And then it happens. And so wow. it's so important to understand that, you know, I mean, we say never again. There's there's a very specific meaning to that. You know, the, the Holocaust did not start with the gas chambers. The Holocaust started with the exclusion and legal oppression of certain groups. And it just grew mm-hmm. because there's this whole question that we've kind of stumbled around of, what if people would have done more? What if, what What if, what if, what if? Um, what if the United States had implemented a, uh, a refugee program before January of 1944? What would have happened? Now, granted, troops couldn't march their way into Poland the second they wanted to. There were limitations to it. But mm-hmm. in the United States, for example, at the time, we had very oppressive immigration laws and quotas The point where, actually, I'm glad we're talking about this because we're reaching the anniversary of it. Um, This is a tangent, but it it exemplifies my point. There was a ship called the MS St. Louis. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this ship, but it was a German Mm -hmm. cruise liner that left Germany. Germany, It left Germany in May 1938 with about Mm 1,000 Jewish passengers on board, um, all of whom had already been vetted to come into the United States. They were just waiting for their number to come up because yes, of the quota yes, system. Yes, yes. Yeah, this is a very famous case. Mm-hmm. So they they mm-hmm. were going to Cuba where they could wait until they came into the United States. Now, when they get to Cuba, long story short, there was some government corruption in Cuba and they were not allowed in. And so what happens is this cruise in liner. Cuba? In Cuba? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um but it gets worse. Um, so this cruise liner cruises up the coast of the United States. Because if you know about, I mean, we all know about geography, but for people listening, Cuba is very close to Florida. They're right there close to the United States. And so people on board are sending wires and telegrams to anyone that they can think of in the United States begging to be allowed in. And so the White House gets a bunch of requests. The mayor of St. Louis, Missouri gets a request because of the name of the ship. And the awful part of all of that is that all of those requests were ignored. The United States does not allow that ship in. It ends up being sent back to Europe. Uh, The captain of the ship makes a deal with three or four nations. It's Great Britain, France, Belgium, and I think Norway are the four who take in groups of passengers from the ship because the passengers refused to go back to Germany, outright refused. And so as we know, if you know anything about the Second World War, Great Britain is the only one of those countries that was not directly invaded by the Nazis. Now they were bombed, but they were not invaded. And so about a third of the prisoners on that ship died in the Holocaust, despite the fact that they were so close to the United States. And so there's so much to wrestle with as Americans about how we responded or did not respond to the Holocaust. You know, so someone like Vitold Pilecki and others are getting information about this out. You know, by by November of 1942, the world knew. I mean, there was there was a press conference in the United States. FDR responded to it. The world knew that the Nazis had a plan to, quote, exterminate the Jewish population of Europe. Yeah, and, it's one of those myths you get in history class that we walked into concentration camps and were like, "What?" Yeah, that's that's who knew. That's the way it was kind of taught to mm-hmm. me. Yeah. So there's there's two different competing myths there. There's the myth that we didn't know anything, which is a myth. We definitely knew, but there's also the myth that the United States ran, you know, went into World War II because we were going to liberate concentration camps and blah 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 blah. So a lot of liberators, people we call liberators, people who entered concentration camps and freed prisoners, do not like being called liberators. Because although the higher ups in the military knew about what was happening because of, you know, all this information that had been transmitted, your average soldier, you know, might have heard some things. But if they've been in Europe for three years, they're not necessarily going to know what's going on. They felt like they just happened upon these camps. And and even for people like... Um, we're going off on a tangent, but this is an important tangent. Um, General Eisenhower, who had a pretty good idea, of course, he becomes president in Eisenhower. General Eisenhower has a pretty good idea of what he was coming up on when he and his troops were about to liberate um, a satellite camp of Buchenwald in Germany. 
not only does he require the troops to tour the camp and to document what he's, they had seen, but he sends a telegram to Marshall right after this. And he says, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he said, I felt it very important for me to be a witness to these things that I could not describe because there may become a day when people call this propaganda and say that it didn't happen. And so a big reason why we know about these things is because people like Eisenhower and earlier on, people like Vitold Pilecki made the decision to document them. And so we'll kind of get to the end of, of Vitold's story, but just the fact that he was transmitting this information is important, not just for the time that he was in, but for us historically, so that we know what was going on in those camps, so that when we say never again, we actually know what that means. My pastor, Steve, he, he said something amazing the other day. He said, there are ways to know things. Uh, one tool you might use is the scientific method. And in the scientific method, you can know X, Y, Z by repeating an experiment and observing it to be true over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. He said, but there are certain things that are unknowable, and most of those things fall within the realm of history. For example, did Washington cross the Delaware for the Battle of Trenton? And the answer is yes. And the question is, how do you know that? Steve does a great job. We should have him on sometime, Matt, just to explain the difference in the scientific method and the historical method. Uh, he would teach both of us a lot. But That's the epistemology episode. <laughs> that'd be great. <laughs> but um, getting to your point, I, I understand what you mean because of his lesson to me. And if it wasn't for someone who, who documented this in a, in a very accurate, very specific way, we wouldn't be able to point to it and say, this is true because. Mm -hmm. Because the historical method is very different than the scientific method. You have to understand context. You have to understand all that stuff. So what is the report that uh, Pilecki wrote? He wrote a report when he got out. What was the name of it? Yeah. So he wrote a, a few reports. I mean, there were kind of individual pieces of information he got out. So he you know, going back to kind of the topic we talked about, he's realizing in 1943 that, you know, this camp has not been bombed yet. I don't know. You know, he, he, he doesn't feel like his information is going through. And so he decides, all right, I got to escape myself. And so he and two other prisoners escape in 1943. And he ends up making his way back to Warsaw, making his way back to the underground. And he, he writes this 100-page report on camp life, which he, of course, transmits through the courier service, and it gets to the right people. But around this time, I mean, this is 1943, and he, and he becomes re-involved in the underground in Poland. And so that information is out there. I mean, by 1943, granted, if you were a small town Kansas, like my family was, you might not have all the information that we have historically. But... Uh, by 1943, this information was printed in newspapers because of things like like people like Witold Pilecki and the fact that American bombers actually flew over Auschwitz and took pictures. So we actually have pictures of what was what was going on. So the information is out there. Meanwhile, he is participating in the underground. He gets himself involved in the October 1944 Warsaw Uprising. That is different than the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which was in 1943. But the Warsaw Uprising was just like the whole city rising up against uh, Nazi oppression. And he gets himself arrested uh, during that by communists in Poland at the time because... In know, 1944? 19, sorry, 1945. Amy, quick sidebar. Yes. The craziest thing about this conversation and the emotion that it stirs in me mm -hmm. is only half of the equation because we're not even going to get to Stalin communist Russia. No. We're not even going to get to the Soviets. Mm -mm. A deal with the devil that it. you had to make because we're not winning that war without the Soviets. But oh my goodness. the. Oof. Let no complaining about Nazism in any way create some kind of smokescreen mm -hmm. where we don't acknowledge the absolute ethical dumpster fire that was going on on the other side, mm -hmm. on the other front as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. I'll shut up again. Please continue. No, this is important because, okay, so he, there's a couple stages here. So he, he participates in the uprising. He actually gets himself arrested, I believe, by Germans for a while, spends the rest of the war in a prisoner of war camp, is freed, and then he goes and joins the free Polish troops in Italy in 1945 and ends up being caught by communists at some point. I'm kind of unclear on how that happened, but he gets arrested by Polish communist leaders in 1945 because the, uh, the Soviet Union just rushes into Eastern Europe and as we know, it becomes the Cold War and the Iron Curtain, and we don't have to go into all of that. But um, to your point, which is very important, 
and this is a very tricky thing to talk about historically, but, you know, people who were liberated from Nazi oppression, from concentration camps, it was great. I mean, it <laughs> to be liberated from that was very important, but it didn't mean that the situation they found themselves in afterwards was all sunshine and roses. You know, so, so one of my areas of study is the Holocaust in Hungary, and uh, the Red Army comes into hungering in the beginning of the, the battle actually starts in, on Christmas Eve of 1944. And then it's about a two month battle until they retake the entire city. And what happens when the Red Army comes in is they sure they push out the Germans, sure they liberate the city, but they start pillaging the city, molesting women, stealing from people who had previously been under under occupation. And so it's great that the Germans are gone. It's great that they're liberated, but it doesn't mean that things are all great once the Red Army shows up. And so that's obviously very true in Poland as well. Um, Poletsky gets himself involved in kind of the underground anti-communist movement very briefly um, until he is arrested within a couple years of the war ending. I like this guy. I mean, it's just like like how I, I mean, I have all these questions, but how, how does someone even do this? But um, like one dude fought mm -hmm. <laughs> Stalin communists and the Nazis, the communists, Nazis. And, exactly. Oh my goodness. Exactly. Yeah, there are no amount of medals. I, I don't well, even, well, yeah. speaking of medals, he was given. Uh, this is how I first learned about about Pilecki, Is I, I had heard that he was given the Order of the White Eagle, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. my understanding is like the highest award that Poland can give, and Pilecki got that. Now, do you know what year he got that in? I don't. No. You know what? I'm not going to tell you because I'll tell you at the end of the story. That's an important oh, part oh. of the story. <laughs> nope, okay. nope. It's important. The narrative is important here. Okay. So he gets himself arrested a couple years after the war ends by communists, and he's put in this show trial where he's not allowed to actually uh, testify. There's no defending witnesses. I mean, it's a real Soviet show trial, like kangaroo court type situation. Like he had no no option of defending himself. And then in May of 1948, he is executed because he's found guilty in this show trial, executed by communists. Now, the reason why I, I want to talk about the year is that... Do we know how he was executed? He was shot in the head. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very quickly. Um, so in the case of Pilecki, and to be honest, a lot of other resistors and a lot of other rescuers, his story is basically buried. People don't really know what he did until after 1989, when the wall falls and when information starts coming out of the former Soviet Union, because he was, he was killed by communists, so they're not gonna be parading that information around. And so he dies believing that his mission had failed. Oh my goodness. Yeah, really, and, and then decades and decades and decades pass, and no one knows who this guy is. I mean, people who directly interacted with him, sure, had some idea, but the world does not know who he is. And so the reason why I didn't want to tell you yet was because he gets the Order of the White Eagle in 2006. What? Decades and decades and decades after he died. So he goes unrecognized for years and years. And like I said, that is true of a lot of resistance efforts because a lot of resistors either died or in many cases just kind of went home and didn't tell anyone. And the information doesn't come out until years and years later, which is why this stories like this are so important because, you know, he's long gone. The only thing that we can do is share this story and think about what we can learn from a story like this. I had an emotional response to that. You know, I had chills, Matt, when you were telling me to write, you know, the, the whole idea of fighting for what is right. And then, like, when you told me that he died thinking he had failed, but he had done so much. That was that, uh, you mm -hmm. know, didn't cry, but eyes watered. I felt very strong emotions when he said that. That's amazing. Can you imagine being anyone in Poland to receive the, the Order of the White Eagle after that? <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, like if, that, if, how do you if compare? That's, what that, wow. <laughs> that's what that means. Good grief. We could go on and on about this, but it's um, and this is a whole other podcast episode. But the man responsible for the largest civilian rescue mission of the entire Holocaust was a man by the name of Carl Lutz, who rescued tens of thousands of people. He also died thinking that he had been unrecognized, dies like not not being recognized. And this is so true of a lot of different people. I mean, if you've seen that very famous like YouTube video of this uh, 
this uh, German man who participated in the kinder transport saved a bunch of children. He might have been British, saved a bunch of children during the Holocaust. And he's sitting in an audience and um, someone on stage yeah. says, hey, have you been if, if anyone in oh, this yeah. room was rescued by this man, please stand up. And the entire audience stands up because they were children who he had rescued. That guy just didn't tell anyone. He just went home and didn't tell anyone what he had done until he tells like his grandchildren. And so there are people like Vitold and Lutz who die before they're recognized, but there are also people who just believe that what they did was what any normal human would do. So I mean, we we talked about before we got on the air, you know, going to Israel at Isra- at Yad Vashem, the. Uh, the, the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Israel, they have something, they, they recognize people that they call righteous among the nations, people who are typically non-Jewish, who helped Jews during the Holocaust through no, and got no sort of material or financial benefit for it. And if you go- Lutz got that award. He right? did. Lutz got that award and his wife got that award in the 1950s and 1960s. Hmm. And if you actually sit down and read accounts by people like that, by resistors, by rescuers, they always say the same thing. They say, you know what, I was just doing what any good person would do. Or someone like Lutz said, I thought it was just a matter of conscience. I mean, these are not people who are thinking, I'm doing something so great. I'm a great person. They're mostly shocked that other people are not doing it, which just is... Right, that's what I was going to say, is that statement is so damning toward... Uh millions upon millions upon millions of others Mm -hmm. no mr lutz you are sadly and sorely mistaken Mm -hmm. that is not what any normal person would do it is what a normal person would boast about from the comfort of his basement where he records a podcast in utter (laughs) safety in the middle of the united states moments before he goes outside to grill hot dogs on the patio grill they yeah Easy for me to say, Mm -hmm. Uh, easy for me to thump my chest and talk about how brave I am and how morally outraged I am. I'm not a coward. I've just never been tested. And that guy Mm -hmm. got tested and he passed with flying colors. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know either. I want to sit here and say like, oh, well, he had the Order of the White Eagle in mind (laughs) when he started by going into the concentration Mm -hmm. camp. I don't think he was thinking that big. No. I think he was thinking more along the lines of, oh, hell no. (laughs) you know know? no you ain't doing that in my poland you're not going to do that to these jewish people um two things i want to say number one i find it interesting that he was a christian and he was fighting for the rights of the jewish people in the area and and, Mm -hmm. and i'm not saying there's anything special about christians in that regard i've seen this happen many different ways and many you know across many different lines but i do think it's very interesting that he's fighting for the rights of another, quote, people group. Um, Mm -hmm. That stands out to me. Another thing is there's this book that was written. I don't remember the name of the book or anything, but I I found this quote over and over when I was reading about uh, Pletsky, and it's the rabbi, Michael Shudrick. Mm -hmm. He was the chief rabbi of Poland, wrote the foreword for this book, and this is what he said. When God created the human being, God had in mind that we should all be like Captain with Vitold Pilecki of blessed memory. May the life of Vitold Pilecki inspire us all to do one more good deed of any kind each and every day of our lives. I thought that was a really good quote. It's a really good quote. It's yeah. it's great and it reflects his life, you know, and he was well we won't have to dwell on it, but when he was in those camp, it was just every day one more good deed, helping one person, helping, you know, finding more food for another person, and that's that's how we did it. One day at a time. Selflessness. Mhm. How do you want to land the plane here? I mean, it's hard to land the plane here with, with questions like this, because I, I'm sitting here thinking, I think the same thing as you all are thinking is, what does this mean for us? What is learning a story like this? What do people listening to this, you know, what do you do now? <laughs> you know, when you, when you hear about something like this, I just think it's so important to learn stories about people like Poletsky because it's, it begins the process or continues the process for some of us of doing that self-reflection, of doing a self-analysis, of asking yourself, what, what would I have done? And, and I think, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of us come to the point of, of saying, I don't know, of I might have stood to the side, I might have not have done anything. And it, it really, for me, ends up being a moral imperative to not only tell stories like this, but to sit down and think about how I can become the type of person who would have done something like Vitold Pilecki did. I think there's tremendous value 
in the details of those uh, of, of those stories because it's one thing for all of us to say man i would sure never want to help unload a bunch of jewish people off of a box car and then gas them to death how morally difficult is it to say that mm-hmm. and hopefully everybody would say that pretty easily but that's not a very sophisticated take because this didn't happen because One day, a bunch of German 20-year-old boys woke up and were like, you know what we should do is we should just gas a ton of Jewish people to death. Let's just do it. That's not how this happened. This wasn't a roving gang. This wasn't a silly idea that happened on a bet between a bunch of teenagers who had too much time on their hands. This was a complex escalation. It was a trillion to the trillionth power, little amoral decisions that people made that people gave a pass to in themselves and in others. It was a billion little concessions that got made in the minds of people and families. It was a billion little lesser of two evil choices that people made when they voted. It was a billion little unsatisfied slights and little moments of pride that people let take root over time. In other words, it was simply an exponentially large version of things that I allow to happen Mm -hmm. in my brain and my heart when I scroll Twitter, when I hear from people whose ideas I don't like very much, when I come up with my strategy for how to vote in the next clumsy, silly election. It's the same stuff that confronts me. And none of us are going to pass this test by any merit of our own effort or energy. There's got to be some kind of, or I should put it this way, none of us are going to pass that test lazily or by default. Mm Mm-hmm. A deep dive into understanding not just that we have problems and struggle with depravity, but how, why, what does it look like? How does it escalate? What did a good person, good person in quotes, who looks just like me, same age, same upbringing, same style, same socioeconomic status, but in the 1930s in Germany, how did that guy go along with this? That's what someone like me needs to know. Mm -hmm. How did that get unpacked? And so every one of these little stories is beneficial in that it helps to paint a more complete picture of how it happened. It's really easy and lazy and not morally courageous for me to say, never again. Well, doesn't that sound noble? What's difficult is to do the hard work of understanding why and then to figure out how to articulate something that is incredibly hot button and and delicate in regards to this topic to say, yeah, maybe again, Mm -hmm. careful. Like I need to tread lightly. I need to tread lightly in how I think about that person and that person and that group and about myself and about my ideology and about political expedience and about careless, casual wishes for violence or some sort of ill fate for somebody who I think has bad ideas or is dangerous. If I want to check the billion little decisions that a whole bunch of people made that got them to this point back in the day, I've got to become a lot more conscious of the billion little decisions that I'm faced with and make them differently than whatever got the people who came before us to the place they got to when they did this. So I need people because I'm not morally sufficient or intelligent or developed enough on my own without a cautionary tale. I need people like this to come along and tell these stories that reach across the decades so that I can see the anatomy of what went wrong in the heart of a people and of individuals And then try to guard myself against making the exact same mistake because I made it the exact same stuff as the people who made this mistake in the first place. So for me, the very passionately held value that I assigned to what you have graced us with, with this great conversation, Amy, is it holds up a mirror to my soul and it's all data that I need to add into the moral equation that I'm running and it helps to understand it in more detail and I understand it better than I ever understood it. And so... I'll try to do things that are responsible and good and redemptive with the information. That's the way I can honor somebody who gave up so much to get the word out. Absolutely. Thank mm-hmm. you very much, Amy. Thank you. <laughs> well, when I when I asked you to teach me about uh, Vitold Poletsky, I had no idea that it would it would be this good. So I, I'm grateful. But this was you, Amy Lutz, is the guardian of memories. I, I think it's only appropriate <laughs> that you get the last word in this. Uh, Agreed. Go ahead. What do you want well, to say? You know what? How, how I actually wanted to end it, I was looking at, up this on my phone as you were talking. There's a great quote from George Eliot that is the title of the movie A Hidden Life, um, in which she says, For the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts, and that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. 
which is to Matt's point about how much of the good in the world is made in those little moments. <laughs>